And this morning, we're going to move past Easter. We're going to look at the next 40 days. What happened the next 40 days? What, what happened to Jesus after that? Can you all see that this morning? Has that been better this morning? Jake has been working on this hard all week. Did he do a great job? Did a fantastic job. So, the gospel wasn't complete with Jesus just raised, you know, being raised from the dead. It didn't stop there. What happened? You know, Jesus, it says that he walked the earth for the next 40 days. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just, you know, be rose from the grave and then right then ascend into heaven? Why did he not do that? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. He'll appear in visions. He'll appear to people personally after he's even went back to heaven. But today we're going to kind of take a look at a chronological order of what is going on in Jesus' life in those next 40 days. And I'll just tell you, it can be a little confusing when you start reading the Bible of like what happened next. Right? Because there, it's, it's spread out. You've got so much going on. There's so many people scurrying around and everything getting in order. Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene. And then some other women at the tomb. They had planned to roll the stone away. They had planned to anoint Jesus. They had planned to come do the things that they didn't get to do when they put him in the tomb. And they were not expecting Jesus to be out of the grave. They were not expecting for that, the stone to be rolled away. Can you imagine when you get to the tomb and the stone is rolled away? I just got to ask you. How many of you have family buried in a cemetery somewhere? Right? What if you went to the cemetery and the grave is open? What are you going to do? You'd be shocked, right? What happened? Don't you know that's what happened to the ladies, Mary Magdalene, when they got to the tomb? They're like, what has happened? Somebody stole that body. But back at the tomb... Mary Magdalene, she ran to tell Peter that somebody had taken his body. The other women were there, and it says that they see angels who explain that Jesus is not there anymore. He's up. He's risen. And they, he, he, the, the angels start instructing the women to go tell other people. And now Mary, he, she's found Peter and John, and they start running to the tomb. And my favorite passage of Scripture, John talks about how he outruns Peter. I love that. When you get to write your own book in the Bible, you get to tell it the way you want to tell it. John tells about, you know, outrunning Peter. But John didn't go into the tomb. John didn't go in. He just looked through the door. But Peter, the bolsterous Peter, the hot Peter, man, he runs into the tomb. Peter was hot. And John believed Jesus was risen. Peter, he was still scratching his head going, I don't know what's going on. And then Mary Magdalene, she stays at the tomb. It says this right here, John 20, 11 through 16, that Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her, because they have taken my, away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, you have, you, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and, and I'll go get him. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni. Now Mary, she leaves at this point and she goes finds the other disciples. And she, she wants to correct them about what she's been telling them. Because she, she had told them that somebody had stole Jesus' body. But now she knew that he was alive. And as she was, as she, as she was headed that way, Jesus appeared to the other women who were looking for the disciples. 
And he says, all hail. They worship him. He tells them to give the other disciples to meet him in Galilee. Now here's the question. Let's get real about this for a minute. You've got some ladies here that have been to the tomb. You've got Mary Magdalene who's been to the tomb. But the rest of the disciples haven't. They don't know what's going on, right? They watched Jesus die on the cross. They watched him be buried. And now these women are coming to to them and saying, Jesus is alive. What are you going to say? You're crazy. You're out of your mind. I watched him die. I saw it. I saw him put him in the tomb. Mary arrives where the disciples were hiding out. They were scared to death. The disciples were scared to death. They they watched Jesus be put to death. Now they're probably thinking, you know, the the government is going to come get us too. They they killed Jesus. And you got these ladies that are telling us that he's alive. What's going on? It says, Mary arrives where the disciples are. Gives them the great news. Mary's excited. She gives them the news. Jesus is alive. But they don't believe her. They don't believe her. The other women arrive and tell their experience. Their experience wasn't the same as Mary's. They weren't together. Isn't Jesus good like that? Like, he, he, he didn't let them be together. He needed two separate accounts. And the disciples still think it's too good to be true. You ever thought something's too good to be true? You don't believe it? At the same time, the guards who had fainted when the angels rolled the stone away had come to and went to the chief priest and to tell what had happened, that he had risen from the dead. Here's the thing. It says, they believed and they began to cover it up. Now, isn't it ironic that the people that walked so closely with Jesus were the ones that didn't believe that he had rose from the grave after he had been telling them that was what was going to happen? The ones that were the closest to him, that had spent the most time with him, they, they were the ones that were worried. I mean, they didn't believe it, but yet... The ones that were trying to shut him down, that didn't believe that he was the Messiah, that didn't believe that he was the Son of God, believed that he had been raised from the dead. Does that seem like us as a church sometimes? We're the hardest ones to believe that Jesus really does do miracles. That Jesus really can do what he says he will do? I mean, don't we often, you ever pray for something and then it happens and then you're like, I can't believe that happened. You prayed for it. Why don't you believe God can do it? Other people believe it. If you pray for it, believe it. Believe it. He was alive. You know, the ones that, that believed it, the, the, the government that was believing it, they were scared to death. You know they were because they thought that now a revolution was about to happen. They thought, man, they're going to lose their authority. They're going to lose their power. We have crucified Jesus and he's up from the grave. What is going on? What are we going to do? Don't you know that they're scared to death? It's still Sunday. And somewhere along this time, Peter leaves the other ten disciples. And Jesus appears to him. We know nothing of what he said, but in my imagination, I can fill in a lot of possibilities. And then Jesus appears to two of his other followers on the road to Emmaus. 
They were down. They were depressed. And as he approached them, they didn't recognize him. They tell their sad story of their loss of their friend, Jesus. They tell how Jesus, they had thought he was the Messiah, but evidently he wasn't because he was crucified. And now he was, he was, he was lying in a tomb. So they thought. And this goes on for some time. And they didn't recognize Jesus as he was talking to them. And they go to eat. And as he gave thanks for the food, when he prayed, their eyes were open. And, he, and they realized that he'd been Jesus all along they'd been talking to. Prayer changes things, right? Prayer changes things. Here's what we do most of the time. Most of the time when something happens in our lives and we, we're upset about it, we start thinking about different things. We pray last. We try to fix it first. Why don't we pray first and try to fix it last? Because most of the time we won't have to fix it if we'll let God do it, right? Let's pray first. Here's the other thing I love about that that it reminded me in this story was Jesus really never leaves us nor forsakes us. He comes to us when we're at the down, when we're at the lowest point. And he wants to lift us up. He wants to bring you joy. He wants to bring you hope. Just like he did those two on the Emmaus Road. They were down. They were depressed. They thought they had, had lost their Messiah. And yet Jesus shows up. And that's what he does. That's what he does. He shows up even before our eyes are open. And those two disciples, they go and find the disciples except for Thomas. And they tell the other disciples the news about Jesus. And they don't believe it. They don't believe it. They don't believe it. They're standing there. And they start telling them about what's happened. They just had an encounter with them personally, and they still don't believe. Hmm. And we don't know what John said because it's not recorded there, but if John started believing after he even looked in the tomb, he didn't speak up here. He didn't speak up. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, Jesus shows up. He just appears in the room. Now, I don't know about you guys. But if I'm standing in a room like this and it's dark. And Jesus just appears right here. And I know he didn't walk in from there and he didn't walk in from there. I'm going to be a little freaked out. And can't you imagine how the disciples were? They're all gathered together. They're already scared to death. And Jesus just shows up after these two disciples are telling him that Jesus is alive and they don't believe it. He just appears. Ooh. They think he's a spirit. I bet they do. But he calms their fears and he shows them the nail prints. He eats a piece of fish with them to show them that he's just not a spirit. They're speechless with joy. Things are coming together. Jesus is back. He begins to open their eyes and he begins to open their understanding. And you know what they want to do? They want to go tell Thomas because Thomas is not there. Thomas is not there. He was missing. Thomas was missing. It's just like what happens when you miss church on Sunday. You can miss the encounter with Jesus that you were looking for. And you may never see it because you weren't there. Now, thank you all for being here this morning. Now, go tell everybody else that he wasn't here. Y'all missed it this morning. Just saying. Don't miss church. He didn't believe it. Thomas, he's got all his buddies around here. All 
the other ten disciples are here. They've all had an encounter with Jesus, each one of them. And they go tell Thomas, and Thomas still doesn't believe them. You got one of those friends that no matter what you tell them, they don't believe it. That's what I'm saying. We all got one, don't we? We all got one. Thomas was the one. And he's like, if I don't see it with my own eyes, I ain't believing it. Mm Mm-hmm. And then next week, next week, Jesus appeared to all 11 of them, and they're all there. And he offered proof to to Thomas. And he said to the others, he says, hey, you know what? You believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe that haven't seen. How many of you believe that, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that? Have you seen it? Not physically. I've seen it spiritually in my life. I've seen him do amazing things that I don't know how that happened. Like the time we were in Haiti and we needed tickets out of the country. Many of you heard me tell that story before. Many of you heard me talk about that. We were standing at the counter. We didn't have, we, we couldn't get the three tickets to, for people to get on the plane to come back. I'm standing there. I don't know what to do. I'm praying. I don't speak Creole. I have no idea what they're talking about. One of our team members standing in front of me, looking at me. Terry standing next to me. I'm praying. One of the airport guys walk up starts telling me what's going on telling me what we need to do telling me not to leave and telling me what to say to the people great thank you for your help i appreciate that i needed help we get our tickets finally we get on the plane the guy that's standing in front of me looks at me and says hey why wouldn't you just go do what they said to do go sit down i said because the guy in the airport told me not to He said, what guy? (laughs) Terry looked at me and said, I didn't see him either. And I'm like, I did. (laughs) Praise the Lord, I did. (laughs) Hallelujah. It wasn't for them to see. God didn't need that. God does what he needs to do. Amen? Amen. And those words are still relevant for today, for us today. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Blessed are those. And I want to be blessed, don't you? What does it take for you to believe? What will God have to do to change your life so that you're totally sold out and you believe 100% that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life? What will it take? That night, seven of the, of, the, of the disciples, they went fishing. That's a good thing to do when you don't know what else to do. You go fishing, right? And they had no luck. They fished all night. Didn't, nothing happened. Nothing happened. I really believe that fishing trip for these guys because this is what they did for their entire life they were fishermen right they wanted they 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 were so unsure about what they needed to do that all they could do is just go back to their own life and you know what they were terribly unsuccessful with it because here's the thing when god calls you to something new you got to leave the old behind right you you can never go back to the old and be successful at it once god calls you to the new It will never satisfy you. You will never be completed by it. When God calls you to the new, you got to leave the old behind. And that's what had to happen for them. And Jesus appeared to them on the shore. And he he instructs them to fish to the other side. Can you imagine? You've been fishing all night long. And Jesus is standing on on the bank and you're tired. You're ready to go to bed. And he says, throw it to the other side now. Oh, Jesus, really? It's 10 feet of the boat, I mean, at the most, right? 
and jackpot. The nets are full. And they realize that wasn't just some guy standing on the shore. That was Jesus. Their eyes were open again. Peter, in Peter fashion, just jumps out of the boat. I mean, he's already walked on water once. I mean, why not try it again? But he's got to get to Jesus just as fast as he can. I believe there are people in this community today that could be Peter's if they just heard the word. There are people that, that are just like Peter that need, that each of us know that just have not started believing yet. And they're just waiting on somebody to tell them about Jesus Christ. And they're going to be just like Peter. They're going to jump out of their boat and they're going to run to Jesus. But we got to tell them about him. And they got to the shore. They started having breakfast with Jesus. And Jesus had a chance to talk to Peter one more time. And he had a chance to restore him to ministry after Peter had denied Jesus. Can you imagine how Peter had been feeling? Ever since that day, he denied Jesus three times, told people he didn't even know who that man was. After he had promised, after he had promised Jesus that no matter what, Jesus, I'll go to the cross with you. Until it happened, he bailed. You know why? He didn't have the Holy Spirit on him. He didn't have the power that God had given him. And you know what? Don't walk in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. you got to have God's strength to do it. And then Jesus, he gives what we call the Great Commission to the disciples. And there's more than 500 people there besides the disciples. 500. There's 500 more people there that, he, that he, he tells this great mission to. That you need to go tell people about me. You need to go tell the world about the good news. There's 500 more. Who were they? Do any of y'all know anybody that was in that 500? No. You know why? Most of them bailed on Jesus after that. Most of them didn't go do what Jesus asked them to do. They didn't go do what Jesus had said for them to do. They didn't do that. You want to be a part of God's ministry? Go do what he says to do. Go do what he's called us to do. Go do what he's asked us to do. And that is... Spread the good news, the gospel. Spread the message. That's what God has called us to do. And there are a lot of people like us in church that are not doing what God has called us to do. They're not, they're not spreading the good news. They're not talking up to people. All they're doing is being complacent. They're like that church we talked about last week in Laodicea. They're not hot. They're not cold. They're lukewarm. They're not worried about serving other people. They're not worried about doing what God has asked us to go do. They're not worried about spreading the gospel of the good news. I don't know about you, but God has been good in my life, right? If he's been good in your life, don't you want to share that with somebody? Don't you want other people to experience that joy that you have in your life? We need to tell them. Here's the thing. His ways are not our ways. And our thoughts are not like his thoughts. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 55, 8 and through 9 says this. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, he said, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You want to think like Jesus? 
you got to spend time with him. You want to act like Jesus? You got to spend time in his word. You got to spend time in prayer if you want to act like Jesus. And most of those 500 did not do that. They wandered away. They left. But you know what? It only takes a handful of people to spark an enormous flame. It only takes a handful of people to spark an enormous flame. Twelve. Twelve took and did what the 500 were willing to do. And you know what? We got way more than 12 in here. Right? Come on. We got way more than 12 in here, right? We can spark a flame that can't be put out if we will just go do it. And it doesn't matter where you are in life. God wants you to go share the gospel of the good news with people, right? The main thing that Jesus wanted to leave him with was now that he was calling them out of the boats and he was calling them to be fishers of men, not fishers of just fish. He called them to something new. He called us to share the gospel and he gave each and every one of us that same directive. And John ends his gospel saying this. He says, John 20, 30 through 31 says, The disciples saw Jesus do many miraculous things in addition to the ones that recorded in the book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, that, that by believing in him you will have life by the power of his name. Here's the thing. Jesus walked 40 days on the earth so that we would believe, so that we would all believe, not just so somebody would believe, that all would believe. He walked on earth and he, 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 he showed up to multiple people so he would have multiple testimonies of who he was, that he was alive, that it was real, and that we didn't have to see him physically to believe, and that if we would believe, we would be blessed. John 21, 24 through 25 says this, this disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here, and we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world couldn't contain the books that would be written. Man, can you imagine how many other miracles and things happened during those 40 days? Jesus spent time with people, healed people, but he's still doing that today. He's still bringing healing to people today. I can promise you. I can't wait to hear from somebody that was down here this morning to share about how God has healed them. Amen? And don't you keep that quiet. Don't you keep that quiet when you receive your healing. If you've got your healing, you need to go tell everybody about it. Because it's going to bring faith to somebody else. Jesus, he continued to teach them. He continued to train them. He prepared them for weeks. It's been 40 days since he arose. He promises to leave them this Holy Spirit. Can you imagine? They don't have any idea what this Holy Spirit thing is. And we're going to be talking about that in the next couple of weeks. The Holy Spirit. Woo! And then as they're watching him, he ascends up to heaven. Can you, can you imagine watching? You're there with Jesus and all of a sudden he just starts rising up. What is happening, you know? Can you imagine what they thought? But they're comforted by angels. See, when Jesus left us physically, he didn't leave us alone. He left us. With the Holy Spirit. But before the Holy Spirit was there, he left them with angels to encourage them. 
He left them with somebody. We're never alone. And the angels told him, he said, hey, you're standing there watching him. He's gone. He's in heaven. But here's the thing. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's going to come back the same way that he left. He's coming back. How many believe that Jesus is coming back? What if he showed up today? What if he shows up in the morning? Are you ready? Are you ready? Hallelujah. Jesus, even he, he returned. He, he talked to Stephen. Showed up to Paul several times. Finally to John in Revelation. Jesus made his encounter with him. Jesus is still alive and well today. And he's about to make another huge appearance. But until he does, we got work to do, right? There's a big fire that needs to be sparked. And I believe not only in our city, but our state, our, our country needs the revelation that Jesus Christ is real and alive. Amen? And there's so many people that have moved away from the faith. There's so many people that need to hear about Jesus. Amen? Amen. But it's up to us if we're going to fan those flames. 500 heard it directly from Jesus' mouth and they didn't do it. Hmm. They made the choice not to do that. What's your choice going to be today? And Jesus doesn't want you to just follow him for this moment. He doesn't want you to follow him for just now. He wants you to follow him every moment for the rest of your life. He wants to be in, in relationship with you. He wants to be in fellowship with you. He wants to be close by you every moment of your life if you choose to. What's your choice? You can't do it if you don't know him. You can't, you can't have that kind of relationship if you've chosen to walk away. Where are you today with your relationship with Jesus? Are you in a good place? Or do you need to change something? Is there something that's in your life that is keeping you from being all in for Jesus? Is there something in your life that's distracting you from having that close relationship with Him? Or are you all in? Only you can decide that. Only you know where you're at. I just want to encourage you not to wait another moment, not another day, not another second to be all in for Jesus. Surrender all if you haven't. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Is there anybody in this room that says, my relationship is not right with Jesus right now, that I want to change that? Is there anybody in here? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Anybody struggling? You struggling to, to know that relationship is right? Maybe you had that relationship and you walked away and you're like, God, I want to get back to you. Jesus is waiting for you. Or maybe you've never known him and you want to get that relationship right for the first time. Is there anybody in here that wants to make a first-time commitment to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Anybody in here? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We've got people in here that say, my relationship's not right. I want to get back to where I need to be. 
And I know this is the salvation prayer, but I want us to all pray it as a unified body of believers. You know why? Because none of us are perfect. Amen? We all make mistakes. But together, we're better than we are separate. Right? So let's all, so pray this prayer after me. Father God, I am a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I know Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave for my sins. And I ask you become Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand clap this morning.